Welcome. I'm Suzanne Watnick. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Northwest Kidney Centers. We're here to take a tour of our dialysis museum. So I'd love to start by giving you a tour of our timeline wall. Northwest Kidney Centers was founded in 1962, but we could not have been founded if we didn't have a way to provide chronic dialysis. And Belding Scribner, really the father of chronic dialysis, is shown here boating across the lake, which is how he got to work every morning. And he created the Scribner shunt, which connected an artery and a vein, and was the first device to allow for chronic dialysis to occur, an incredible innovation. With the invention of the Scribner shunt, we were able to start a chronic dialysis program. And so we founded the Seattle Artificial Kidney Center. It was the first dialysis organization in the world, now the Northwest Kidney Centers. And it opened in January of 1962. Three patients at a time could get twice weekly treatments, which is different than what you see now. And each one at that time was 12 to 16 hours long in comparison to what you usually think of as perhaps a four hour treatment. We recognized that there were too many patients for the chairs available to dialyze in. And so this committee was formed, comprised of the lay public, a banker, a surgeon, a pastor, a housewife, a labor leader. This was a topic of a very famous article from Life magazine. They pondered in that magazine the implications of what it meant to decide who would live and who would die. And really, this gave rise to the formal study of bioethics in this country. As we continue on down the wall, I think it's important to highlight a few of the people who experienced kidney failure and were able to live with this innovative treatment, dialysis. So the first person to receive chronic maintenance dialysis was Clyde Shields. He was a machinist and he received these 16-hour treatments at the university in the early 1960s. And in fact, he, along with two other gentlemen who were chosen, ended up being the first three folks to dialyze and they lived for over 10 years. The next person we have on our wall is Dr. Christopher Blagg. So he has been a tireless advocate of dialysis and with his vision and leadership, we were able to grow Northwest Kidney Centers to what it is today. 1985 with Joe Eschbach. Dr. Joe Eschbach chaired the Board of Trustees for quite some time and was a principal investigator in the use of epigen. The use of epigen really markedly helps to improve patients' quality of life for those who suffer from end-stage kidney disease. Into the 90s, Joyce Jackson was hired in the late 1990s as president and CEO and remained as president and CEO for 21 years. Moving into 2008, after five years of planning, the University of Washington Department of Medicine, in collaboration with Northwest Kidney Centers, ended up opening the Kidney Research Institute and hired Jonathan Himmelfarb to head that. The research that has come out of this has already been showing improvements to the lives of people with kidney disease, bringing research into our facilities. And with that, we have our last plaque along this wall, which is from 2012 when the museum opened. It was our 50th anniversary. So with that, I'd love to take you into the heart of the museum and show you many of our artifacts that we have. So we'll start over here with one of our most important pieces. This is a Kolf Brigham rotating drum kidney created in concept originally by Willem Kolf. And this particular piece was developed by John Merrill and Edward Olson in 1948 at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital. This machine treated people with acute kidney failure from trauma, surgery, or other causes. This is the Mini 2, which was created in the 1960s. Four very smart folks were taking a flight from Seattle to the East Coast to a medical conference and they refined the Mini One, which was the first home dialysis machine to create just this. And this ended up becoming a prototype for all future chronic home dialysis machines for the next several decades. Right here, a little bit out of order, is a Skaggs Leonard's dialyzer. 
This was one of the original dialyzers that was used in conjunction with something like the rotating drum kidney. When I show you a newer dialyzer, you'll see that certainly we've been able to miniaturize quite a bit in comparison to this. As we continue down through time, we can see now the Keel dialyzer, which was used by a number of folks in the 1960s. Dr. Scribner brought one of these developed by somebody named Fred Keel in Norway, back from Europe, and ended up having somebody in Everett, Washington, produce these dialyzers. Treatments with these took about 10 hours or so. They could be used in the home, and the patient would actually have to set up these machines, unscrew, all of the nuts and bolts, appropriately replace what needed to be replaced and redo them for every single treatment. In fact, we have a person who is still with us today who dialyzed on one of these back in 1968 before she received a kidney transplant. Really remarkable. Continuing on down, we have a Drake Willick machine. This was designed by Drake and Willick in Oregon. This is one of the later models. It allowed new kinds of regulatory mechanisms to control at a finer level what kinds of fluids were used and how the pressures were transmitted to patients. So it was yet another innovation that was right here in the Pacific Northwest. So let's go up a little further on our wall and let's look at our dialyzers. I showed you a little bit earlier in the tour a very large dialyzer. You can see that these are somewhat miniaturized here. And these were the first low flux and high flux fiber dialyzers that we use. I'm gonna to continue to show you a few of the Cove machines. The Cove machines brought in the capacity to do some of this volumetric control. And in the mid and late 1980s, the fine control about how to remove fluid was added to the backs of the machines, and it really allowed the staff to then regulate the speed of fluid and waste removal at a greater degree than they were able to in the past. As we continue, we get to the COBE mm. System 3. This was actually a machine that I was trained on. It brought in the next generation of even finer control to the Pacific Northwest. And moving over to the last of our machines, in the collection is the B. Braun machine. It was really the first of the machines that were purchased by Northwest Kidney Centers from this group, specifically for home dialysis patients. At this point, our entire fleet are B. Braun machines, and they continue to provide care for all of our patients in center. And so with that, I'd love to bring us over to the peritoneal dialysis section of our museum. So two important folks in this field were Dr. Fred Bone and Dr. Henry Tankoff. Dr. Bone worked with Dr. Scribner at the University of Washington and developed the first successful peritoneal dialysis technique to treat chronic kidney disease in the hospital. At that time, Dr. Henry Tankoff joined Dr. Bone and four years later came up with the Tankoff catheter, which was and still is the most widely used peritoneal dialysis catheter in the world. Along with that, I think it's uh, worthwhile to point out one of the glass containers for the peritoneal dialysis fluid. This had to be mixed by individuals at that time. Now people get pre-mixed solutions that come in plastic containers and are delivered on a regular basis. We then had machines that could deliver the peritoneal dialysis fluid via a cycler system so that peritoneal dialysis patients could actually hook themselves up at night, for example, go to sleep, wake up in the morning, and have completed their dialysis for that day. So this is a much older example of physio control, and this is a more modern one, Baxter Home Choice Pro Machine from the 1990s, which you'll still see for some patients in this era, along with some of the newer technologies, which we have also been able to harness here at Northwest Kidney Centers. This is an EMEA automated PD system, which we started using in 2016. The last section I'd love to show is the home hemodialysis section. Right now in this country, it's just under about 2% of people on dialysis that use home hemodialysis to perform their dialysis treatments. 
And the first machine I want to show you is the Mini One. I mentioned this a little bit earlier in the tour. So this is from 1964. And the Mini One, or the Mini Monster, was created for a specific patient and became the prototype for nearly all single patient hemodialysis machines in use today. The patient was only 15 years old, and because of that, she could not receive dialysis at the Seattle Artificial Kidney Center. So Dr. Scribner, along with Les Babb, worked together very hard with a team of nephrologists to adapt one form of a machine, and within six months, they created this mini monster, which was really quite a miracle in itself. As we continue on down the line, we see an Axis PhD system machine, which the Northwest Kidney Centers used as one of the first in the country to use this machine, ended up leading to FDA approval. And now we use the next stage machines for our home hemodialysis patients. This is the actual dialysis machine used by one of our patients when he rafted down the Grand Canyon in July of 2013. So Bill Peckham was a remarkable individual who insisted that he was going to live the life that he was meant to live. And he did, he traveled the world, even requiring dialysis. With that, I think we're going to conclude our tour. So please remember the history of where we've come from, understand what it is now to be a person with kidney disease and help us to work towards the future to help innovate for people with kidney disease and maybe cure it. Thank you very much.